So, in November of the year 1915, Albert Einstein, for the first time, wrote down the equations of his general theory of relativity. And that marked the starting point of a great success story. His general theory of relativity could immediately explain some of the biggest unsolved problems in physics and astronomy at his time. And even better, his theory has continued to explain new discoveries, such as the existence of black holes or recent discovery in cosmology. In fact, one consequence, one theoretical consequence of one of the equations Einstein wrote down is the existence of a cosmological constant. That is, a force that keeps our universe expanding at an accelerated rate. When Einstein realized that, he called it the biggest failure of his career. But after taking a lot of data in 1998 with satellite technology, we know he was completely right. So you see, his general the theory of relativity has been successfully and very broadly um, applied across physics. And one of the applications I want to talk today about is GPS, is the global positioning system. So if you have ever used a GPS, let's say on your smartphone or in your car's navigational system, you have benefited directly from Einstein's general theory of relativity. You might have not known about it, but that will change now. All right, so once somebody asked the famous physicist John Wheeler to explain general theory of relativity in one sentence. And what John Wheeler said is, there's nothing around us in the world except curved space-time. What he meant is that Einstein's general theory of relativity describes gravity, the force that attracts massive objects like the Earth and the Sun. It describes gravity as a geometric property in terms of space and time, or space-time. And all the, the phenomena we see related to gravity around us are just manifestations of how curved space-time is. So what I want to do in the next 15 minutes is explain to you exactly what curvature is, how to compute it, and why it matters for your GPS. So the work of Einstein wouldn't have been possible at all without the work of two mathematicians, two German mathematicians, I might add, <laughs> 90 years before Einstein. You see the gentleman here on the left, it's Carl Friedrich Gauss, on the right is Bernhard Riemann. And what they did is they gave a precise definition of curvature is, uh, of what curvature is and how to compute it. So let's put ourselves in their shoes. Let's ask the question, what is a good notion of curvature? What is a good notion of how curved an object is? Let's start with the simplest object, just a uniformly curved object, a circle. What would be a good notion of curvature? Well, we can define the curvature of a circle to be the reciprocal of its radius. In that way, if you have a very small circle, which is bent very sharply, the curvature is big. But if you have a very big circle with large radius, which is bent less sharply, the curvature is small. Now you can go to a more general curve, like the black curve I plotted in that picture. And you can ask, can I still compute the curvature at each point of the curve? And the answer is yes. All you have to do to compute the curvature in one point is, you have to find a circle which best fits the shape of the curve in that particular point. Once you have done that, all you need to do is measure the radius and keep going as before. Compute the curvature as the reciprocal of the radius. Now let's do a little thought experiment. Imagine that you and I are tiny entities confined to live 
on that curve. Not a very pleasant picture, but let's stick with it. Would there be a way that you and I could figure out that we live on this curve rather than a straight line? The answer is no. And people in the 18th and 19th century already knew how to prove that. The fact is, you can only measure the curvature at each point of this curve if you know how this curve sits in the surrounding plane. Now, the story gets a little bit more interesting if we consider surfaces in three space. And I put some surfaces up here for you. In the top left corner, you see a disk. Next to it, you see the surface of a ball, which we call a sphere. And below, you see some more general surfaces. Now, you could ask, well, for any of those surfaces at any given point, is there, again, a good notion of how curved the surface is? And the answer is yes. But you see, on a surface, as opposed to the curve before, I can move in two independent directions back and forth. So measuring the curvature at the point of a surface now involves attaching two circles to that point, one in each independent direction, and measuring their curvature and multiplying it. Now, the study of curvature and surfaces was revolutionized when Carl Friedrich Gauss wrote two important papers in 1825. And what he did in those papers is exactly what we did for the curves before. He did the little thought experiment, putting himself in the shoes of a tiny entity living on top of any of those surfaces. And he asked, as little bacterium or ant living on those surfaces, can I, by some clever measurement, figure out whether I'm living in a flat plane or a curved surface? And the answer is yes. And I'll show you in a second how to do it. But before we do that, I want to tell you um, that Gauss called this theorem his remarkable theorem. And what it says is simply that the curvature at each point of a surface, today we call it Gaussian curvature in his honor, that this curvature can be computed from the inhabitant, inhabitants of each of those surface worlds from within their world. All right, now you might already be curious, how do I figure out whether I live on a sphere or on a flat disk, as actually people believe, you know, that we live on a flat disk at some point. Well, here's the procedure Gauss proposed to figure it out. Take three points on your surface, so let's start with the disk, and find the shortest connection between these three points. Well, on the disk, this is rather straightforward, right? The disk is a part of a, just a plane. And you might remember that in a plane, the shortest connection between two points is just a straight line. So, so far, so good. So let's take our three different points. Let's connect them with straight lines. And what did we get ourselves? Well, an ordinary triangle. You can see it right there. Now, you might remember that if I take the sum of all the interior angles of, an, of a triangle, I get 180 degrees. Now let's do the same on the sphere and see whether we still get the same answer. So we pick three points on our sphere, and now we want con to connect them with shortest connection. Now, if you have ever taken a plane, let's say from Boston to San Francisco, and you have tracked the flight path on the, um, what is it called, onboard entertainment system of your plane, you know that the shortest connection, the path your plane takes, is not a straight line. The plane actually goes in a curved line or a part of a great circle on a sphere. So 
keeping that in mind, keeping our frequent flyer experience in mind, we go back to the sphere and we do the same as before. We take three points and we find the shortest connection between these three points. Now let's compute the sum of the interior of those angles, of the interior angles of this object. Not quite a triangle, but um, let's still do that. And you see that the angles in the bottom are already right angles or 90 degrees. So whatever number I get, when I add all the interior angles of this triangle, I get more than 180 degrees, right? And that's exactly what Gauss realized. He realized that the curvature is related to the difference between the sum of all the angles in a triangle minus 180 degrees. Let's check. On the disk, what do we have? We have an ordinary triangle, and the angles add up to exactly 100 de 180 degrees. So the difference is zero. And the curvature of this flat disk is zero. On the sphere, what did we get? Well, the sum of the interior of the angles was bigger than 180 degrees. So the difference is positive. And you see, the sphere is a positively curved object. So this is how Gauss figured out how you can compute the curvature from within your surface world. Now you might think that talking about curvature in the abstract is not really that interesting. But you can see the consequence of this remarkable theorem every day. So if you have ever tried, for example, to, as a present, to wrap a soccer ball, what you must have realized is that you can't bend um, the, the paper on the surface of the ball without crumpling the paper at some point. And Conversely, if you have ever taken, let's say, a peel of an orange or a piece of a peel of an orange, and you have tried to flatten it out on the table in front of you, you must have noticed that you have to split the edges in expansion if you really want to flatten out the peel. And those are just consequences of the fact that the curvature of the sphere is positive and it's different from the curvature of a flat plane. Now, this observation I just described to you is of enormous significance in cartography when you are trying to make maps. How come? Well, what we just realized is that you cannot make a perfect map of a sphere on a plain sheet of paper, right? Let me demonstrate this to you in a particular example. So we already realized that you can take a piece of paper and fold it perfectly on the surface of a sphere, but there's one thing you can do. You can just take your sheet of paper, make a cylinder, and stick the cylinder around the model of a globe. And now, if the paper is somewhat transparent, you could draw on the paper how you see the globe, and in this way, you have made a map of the Earth. It's called the Mercator projection of the Earth. But you see, this map is far from being perfect. It actually distorts the size of certain objects. Look at the map. The size of Africa, in comparison to maybe the size of Europe and North America, is way too small. And we know why. Uh, any map of the Earth can't be perfect. Now, interestingly, this problem of making a perfect plane map of a weirdly shaped object was what got Gauss started on his research in the first place. So what happened was that the king of Hanover wanted a perfect map of his magnificent territory when Gauss realized actually there might be a problem. And this is how he got started on his research on curvature. So I've explained to you how for a surface you can compute the curvature from within the surface. Now the other mathematician I showed you in the beginning 
Bernhard Riemann took these results of Gauss and generalized it to far more complicated objects. And he still found the same results. You can define curvature and you can compute the curvature from within these more complicated objects. What Einstein did is he took curvature and applied it to space-time around us. In fact, his celebrated equations of the general theory of relativity, all they say is that the curvature of space-time at each point is equal to the mass, energy, and radiation there. That's it. Now, you see, for this equation to even make sense, to be useful, to, um, to use it in a computation, we really need that curvature to be computed from within. And this is how the work of, of Gauss and Riemann was really important in general relativity. Now let's go back to the GPS. How does GPS work? Well, you have a bunch of satellites which orbit the Earth, and they constantly send out signals. And now you are sitting in your car driving, and what your GPS receiver does is it receives the signals from different satellites, and depending on the order and time difference in which those signals arrive, you are able to triangulate your position on Earth. That's how GPS works. Now you see, for this to work, one thing is very essential that the clocks on board of the satellites, of the GPS satellites orbiting the Earth, and the clock on Earth in your car are in perfect sync. Now, the curvature of space-time caused by the heavy mass of our Earth makes the clocks on Earth tick a little slower than the clocks on the satellite. Now, you might think, OK, that can't be a problem, but think about it. As time goes on, this effect would accumulate and accumulate. So what do you have to do? You have to permanently slow down the clocks in the GPS satellites by a constant factor. And what is that factor? It's the curvature of space-time. So now you see how Einstein got GPS to work because he figured out what the curvature of space-time is. Thank you very much.